much, um, Vase. Thank you very much to ASIL and, and to the Government Attorney Interest Group for, for co-hosting this great event. Um, a warm welcome to, to all of you who are watching. I'm Ricardo Chanda. I'm the co-chair of, of INTLAW, um, of this informal group of embassies, legal attaches in Washington, D.C. And as a quick heads up, Gonzalo and I will stick our heads together and come up with lots of fun events for the next few months. So stay tuned. Um, I'm also the legal advisor at the Embassy of Switzerland, where Schrems II and the Swiss-US Privacy Shield keeps me busy on a very regular basis. So I'm very much looking forward to learning more from our wonderful panelists today. The topic is Mission Impossible. I hope not, and thank God Tom Cruise normally or always finds a, a solution. He is, however, and it's, I think, 240th or something sequel, so I hope we'll find a more uh, sustainable or, or final mechanism before that. And with this, um, to Katie, thank you. Thanks so much, Ricarda. And thank you, Wes, and many thanks to, the, to you and the ASIL staff for helping us put together this, uh, this webinar. As um, Wes said, I'm Katie Nesbitt. I'm one of the vice chairs of the Government Attorneys Interest Group. And thank you, Ricarda, and the International Legal Attaches of Washington for co-sponsoring this event with us. Um, I'd also like to extend, I'd like to extend a special thanks on behalf of our interest group to our panelists, as well as all of our attendees for joining us today for what I know will be a lively and informative discussion of the Schrems II decision from the perspective, the unique perspective of government and public interest attorneys who have been uh, actively working on the ground on these issues on behalf of their respective governments and institutions. So um, I know we wanna to get to the substance of the discussion. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. If they could uh, turn their cameras on. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Alex Joel, who's our moderator. Alex is a scholar in residence and adjunct professor at the American University of Washington College of Law. He recently retired from the US Office of Director of National Intelligence, where for 14 years he served as Chief Civil, Chief Civil Liberties Privacy and Transparency Officer. He's currently conducting research, developing programming and teaching courses focused on the intersection between law, national security, technology and privacy. Next, I'd like to introduce Dylan Kors. Dylan serves as the International Director in the Law and Policy Office of the National Security Division at the US Department of Justice. The Law and Policy Office advises on issues arising from National Security Divisions, Prosecuting, Intelligence, and other sections, and also works with other US departments and with foreign partners to develop and implement the US Department of Justice and US government policies with respect to intelligence, counterterrorism, and other national security matters. Dylan's work includes advising on the effect of potential US government access to personal data on cross-border data flows from the EU under the GDPR, and the development of executive agreements between the US and other countries for enhanced cross-border access to electronic data to counter serious crime by the Cloud Act which was recently enacted by the US. Next, I'd like to introduce Alex Greenstein. Alex served as the director of the EU US Privacy Shield program since July 20, it was currently serving, sorry, as the director of the EU US Privacy Shield program since 2019 at the US Department of Commerce. In this role, he's responsible for management and administration of the Privacy Shield program, as well as policy relating to transatlantic data privacy data flows and digital trade issues. Alex has served in the senior Alex has also served in senior policy positions related to these same issues at the US State Department, White House, and National Security Council, where he oversaw the negotiation of the EU, EU US Privacy Shield. Next is Estelle Massé. Estelle is a senior policy analyst and global data protection lead at Access Now. Her work focus, focuses on data pr protection, privacy, surveillance, and telecom policies. And she leads the work of the Organization on Data Protection in the EU and around the world. She's a member of the multi-stake expert group of the European Commission to support the application of the GDPR. Finally, I'd like to introduce Rosalba Striani. Rosalba is a senior legal officer with the European Commission responsible for international data flows and protection portfolios 
on transatlantic data privacy, including the EU-US Privacy Shield and the EU-US E-Evidence Agreement, as well as shaping the data privacy form of Brexit. With 20 plus years of experience in the public sector, Rosaba has held several posts within the European Commission and the Italian Competition Authority and has defended the commission in more than 20 cases before the European courts. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks Katie, thanks uh, Ricarda, and thanks to the American Society uh, for International Law for uh, having us on. I think this is gonna be a fantastic panel. Uh, I do think uh, that the Mission Impossible theme should be playing right now. I, I am personally a fan of both the TV show and those movies. Obviously, if we're the impossible mission force, then I think I have to be the Tom Cruise character. I, I just feel like that should be logically uh, true. Uh, but thanks to the great panelists, we're going to talk about uh, the current crisis. There are so many crises that are in the news today, but we shouldn't lose sight of this one. Uh, this is a really important one for transatlantic data flows, as well as really for global commerce in the new digital uh, world that we live in. And we, we, we struggle with the issue of how do you protect privacy in the context of national security with global data flows, with the, the cultures and traditions uh, around privacy and data protection uh, that, that, that are really are prevalent in a lot of the discussions and, and that differ from country to country. Uh, we, I just was teaching a class last night where I was talking to the students and trying to figure out are privacy attitudes really that different between European attitudes, US attitudes, and around the world? And I think there's a lot of convergence. Uh, there are some differences, obviously, culturally, historically, and in our legal frameworks. Um, and that's just around privacy, not getting into the whole very difficult legal area, as well as um, not to mention the substantive area of national security. Uh, which is where I spent the last 15 years at that intersection. I think we have some great panelists who have also done a lot of terrific thinking. I'd like to kick this off by just trying to get us all, uh, particularly those uh, coming in from the outside, on the same page in terms of what is the issue that we're talking about. So I'm going to go through a quick chronology. I'm going to go through this fast, um, and then we'll, we'll dive into questions to the panelists. So um, the European Union in 1995 issued the Data Protection Directive, which called on the member states of the European Union to develop laws and harmonize them to protect privacy uh, in, in Europe. And one of the key concepts that this directive put in place was this idea that if you take data, personal data, outside of Europe to another country, if you're a company that does that, you need to do that through certain mechanisms, through certain procedures that were put in place by the directive and required of EU member states. And so, you know, just to shorthand that, that was thought of as exporting the data. And, and again, I'm going to oversimplify, but the idea was you should be taking data out to another country only if you can protect the data in a manner similar to how it's protected in the European Union. Now, I vastly oversimplified that, but just bear with me. So in order for the United States to be uh, able to receive data that was taken out of Europe at the time and out of the EU at the time, uh, the Department of Commerce entered into something called the Safe Harbor. This was in 2000, established a set of principles that companies would agree to uh, with certain re uh, remedial mechanisms in order for to assure the European Union that they were protecting the data adequately. Um, there was an exception in the Safe Harbor for national security. There was also there were also exceptions in the Data Protection Directive for national security. Um, Fast forward to 2013, the Snowden disclosures raise a lot of concerns about how US is conducting uh, surveillance at the time. Coming out of that, there were reforms, uh, most notably in 2014, the issuance of Presidential Policy Directive 28 in the United States, which sought to uh, apply additional privacy protections uh, to people regardless of nationality. Again, I'm going super fast here. Um, after that, uh, there was a case brought by Max Schrems and the first um, Schrems ruling came down and, and it, by the Court of Justice of the European Union invalidated Safe Harbor. Uh, the US and the EU then uh, negotiated and, 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 and thought through how can we replace Safe Harbor with something um, different that would allow the data flows to continue in a privacy protective manner. And uh, that's when 26, uh, in 2016, Privacy Shield was put into place. 
Um, in the meantime, GDPR, uh, basically around 2016, was passed in Europe and in the EU and went into effect in 2018. That's the General Data Privacy Regulation, which um, updated and was more uh, made uh, more uniform and made, made it more mandatory, the prior uh, protections that were in the Data Protection Directive for 95. So that's where you talk about GDPR now that came in around that time. Trends challenged um, the transfers that were going on. Uh, uh, tr a different transfer mechanism when, went back up to the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Court of Justice of the European Union ruled in 2020 uh, that the uh, privacy shield was invalid because of the way that the US surveillance framework uh, was working and um, also called into question the ability to transfer data under other mechanisms such as something that we call standard contractual clauses uh, in the EU. So went by super fast, although it might have seemed tediously long to, to many of you. Let me now switch over to the expert panel. Uh, Dylan, as you may have heard from the introductions, uh, has played a lead role in, the, in representing US interests in the litigation that's been going on in the European Union that's precipitated all this. Dylan, could you give us a more of a flavor of, of that particular lit litigation in Schrems II and what was the US role in that litigation? I feel like Dylan is. Uh, I think Dylan is frozen. Is he? Is is it just me, or is it everybody else? Okay, I see nodding of heads, thinking. All right, so Dylan, we're we're going to let you resolve the Wi-Fi issues there, um, and let me just say, suffice to say, in terms of the litigation, it didn't come out well for the U.S. government. The U.S. government made the um, took the position that uh, through um, you know uh, through submissions to the court. I mean, we weren't directly again. To the end, did you? Uh, no, Dylan, you're still coming across. Are you done? I, you're out. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Uh, so we'll switch over to Alex. Um, so the Schrems II ruling comes down. It says basically finds some problems with the U.S. Uh, framework uh, for overseeing um, surveillance and protecting privacy. And um, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about the U.S. government response and reaction? Like, what did you think of the of the opinion, and how how is the U.S. government dealing with it? Yeah, certainly. Um... I was just going to tell Dylan that he needs to get his kids off of the internet um, or else uh, he won't be able to do this. But uh, no, certainly, I mean, the United States was uh, very concerned about the outcome of the court decision. It certainly isn't what we had hoped for and what we sort of and the commission um, argued strongly sort of in the case that sort of in defense of the uh, adequacy determination for privacy shield. But I mean, it is the court's decision. And so we're working to address it and find a way to move forward. Um, we're definitely a very much concerned about the uncertainty that you found that the court's decision has created uh, about transatlantic data transfers. Um, certainly the invalidation of privacy shield, uh, privacy shield is no longer a mechanism that companies can use to transfer data, but also um, it has created instability and concern about the durability of the standard contractual clauses and also transfers under binding corporate rules and other mechanisms. And so, yeah, when you said crisis, I mean, it is a crisis um, when the entire sort of basis for transatlantic data transfers is brought into um, question. And so that's something where we had had extensive discussions about this with the commission. We always knew this was a possibility. And so even before the Schrems II decision, we had been having discussions about what we might do. And then immediately following the decision, we and our partners in the European Commission um, put our heads together and discussed this further. And uh, you saw immediately following the decision, there was a joint statement from um, Secretary of Commerce and uh, Commissioner Renders um, stating our intention to work together to establish an enhanced framework that would address the court's concerns. And so we're continuing those discussions now and are moving forward um, to find a way to sort of resolve this issue. 
And, and I know that part of what you were focused on, Alex, was the reaction on the part of, of companies. Can you, uh, we don't have somebody directly from the private sector on this panel. Can you uh, give us a sense for what their reaction was and what you have, what the US government has been doing? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's an, uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty, I would say, in like the market right now, and companies certainly are facing a lot of tough decisions. Um, certainly, you can't use Privacy Shield for transfers anymore, and that has had a major impact on sort of uh, companies' ability to do business with Europe. And Privacy Shield is uh, seventy-five percent small and medium enterprises, and those companies who are the least um, able to make use of other transfer mechanisms. And so certainly that's had an impact there. But then also um, you've had some carry on impact on larger firms as well. Many larger firms use Privacy Shield for data transfers in um, for uh, human resources data and other sort of like you know, types of data. And now they're facing some issues there. And then also you do have concerns that um, the ability of companies to use the SECs could potentially be impaired. And that would be um, catastrophic. And so that's certainly something that we're very much focused on. And we've tried to provide uh, as much information as possible to companies to enable them to use the SCCs for transfers um, and make the best case possible to um, DPAs that um, they should be able to continue using that. So we put out a white paper, um, I believe it was back in October um, that detailed a number of um, a great deal of information sort of about U.S. Um, policies and sort of national security access to data that companies can use when they need to make this justification to the DPAs for continuing to use the SCCs. And that also sort of in the medium term, um, our goal is to work with our partners in the commission to um, develop an enhanced privacy shield framework that will once again be um, a valid data transfer mechanism. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Let me let me switch back to Dylan now that we've got him back online. He was there. He was there just an instant ago. <laughs> I think we're having still having connections problems with Dylan. Oh, there you go, Dylan. Are you with us? Yes. Hopefully you are. Can you see us? I think you're muted still. All right. Well, we're having still having some issues with Dylan. <laughs> um, okay. Can you hear me? Oh, now I can hear you. Uh, you may want to just turn off your video and talk because I think maybe that might be putting a strain uh, on your connection. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I think I, I think we're we'll we'll come back to you, Dylan. Um, let me go up to Rosalba now and bring you into the conversation. Um, so we've heard, you heard a little bit from the US government side in terms of its response, companies are concerned. Um, I guess one of the things that we should point out and, and put on the table right away is that in the decision, uh, there was no grace period. Uh, and so companies are subject to this decision right now. And just to summarize, uh, the key part of the decision was it invalidated Privacy Shield, which was one of the ways in which companies could bring data back to the United States. There are other ways like uh, entering into contracts that have some approved clauses in them that, that provide additional measures of protection for the data. But, but part of the court's ruling was, well, those a, a, co a company cannot contract around a mandatory requirement in the, co in the country that it's bringing the data to uh, to uh, comply with an order to give up some of their data. They can't, they can't mitigate that in a contract uh, fully. And so um, that's what called into question this issue of standard contractual clauses. But there have been a lot of questions around what, do, what does the Schrems ruling mean? Um, what is guidance that can be provided to the companies? Uh, Rosalba, can you talk a little bit about the EU response to the decision and what's been going on uh, from your end? Yeah, thank you, sure, Alex. So indeed, the, the, as you said, the, the, the court uh, did not only invalidate the privacy shield, but upheld 
the standard contractual clauses that are clauses uh, that are uh, inserted in contract between the exporter and the importer. This is another transfer tool that is available under the GDP, GDPR for companies to transfer data from the Europe from Europe to the US. And, may, and I have to say, this is the most used transfer tool from company. Of course, an adequacy decision is uh, an, a decision which um, put a, a third country uh, as uh, in the role of a member state. It's like extending the single market for those that third country. So company do not have to um, worry about their transfer while the standard contractual clauses are not country specific. So de they depend on the contract, on the type of the contract, the type of data transfer. So what the court said in the in the decision is the, the model uh, um, provided by the commission is fine and um, and you can use it. However, you have before transferring your data, you have to look at the legislation of the third country where you're transferring your data to see whether there is any law, not necessarily only in, uh, national security law, but any law, it might be retention law or any specific law in a financial market, whatever, that may impinge on the safeguards that these standard contractual clause provides. And uh, of course, I mean, this is built on the, um, let's say, the principle of accountability that is already uh, um, that is shrink from the GDPR from the company. So what the response of the commission, of course, apart engaging from with the, our US um, counterpart and trying to uh, understand how to address the shortcomings uh, raised by the court for the, um, the in the privacy shields. Um, was also to modernize our standard contractual clauses in light of what the court uh, said. In, in reality, the process of modernization of standard contractual clauses already started before Schrems II to align these clauses to the new requirement of the GDPR and to make it more friendly. But however, we had added a specific part that uh, would uh, help company to understand how to address this new challenge. And um, what we provide is uh, a sort of methodology that uh, the company has to follow to, um, to understand whether in, that, in their specific case, uh, they would need to uh, adopt other supplementary measures that could help their contract to survive. And um, so, there is not uh, uh, um, uh, a solution um, for all the contract. It's a sort of checklist that the company should go through to understand whether their specific um, transfer is um, needs one or the other at the other supplementary measure. It might be that the, that the result is that there are no supplementary measures to overcome the the problems that are found in the third country. And among uh, um, among those uh, new safeguards that we provide in the standard contractual clauses, we also provide some guidance to the party to understand how to reply to government uh, requests. And on the basis of this, I mean, this work has been complemented by the um, EDPB guidance. The EDPB is the board of the data protection authorities, which play an important role in this uh, scenario because they are the real enforcers. So they are the one that can stop the, the transfer. And um, the EDPB has adopted this uh, so-called recommendation on supplementary measures that are quite detailed and uh, provide some um, also their examples to company to verify whether they can be useful for their transfer. And, um, and of course, I mean, these guidance are extremely important also for the enforcement of the Data Protection Authority and to ensure a consistent uh, response to the to the to the market so basically with the guidance the company should the, the, the guidance as well as the standard contractual clauses are structured on three levels. The first thing is to understand. So it is called know your transfer. You have to understand what type of transfer and what type of data you, you are transferred. 
then you have to uh, assess whether for that type of transfer there is any legislation that could impinge on your contract. And then as a third stage, once you have verified all this and you have kept record of this, because also this is an important element to take into account, to keep record of this, because when the Data Protection Authority will call you to see to, to, to verify whether you have been um diligent in uh, tracing your your um, your transfer already you have to demonstrate that uh, you have done your job then there is indeed uh, the possibility look at this supplementary measure that can be of an organizational or technical or uh, legal nature and for as a way of example i would say uh, as a technical measure of course we speak about encryption or uh, as an organizational measure we speak about for example dedicate create a dedicated team into the company to assess the request coming from the government and to verify whether it is possible to um, to challenge it so um, as i said it's a case by case analysis it cannot be um, uh, a, a fix for all and um, and the company um, will be helped also through the guidance of the of the DPA. Yeah, thank you, Rosalba. So, uh, and there has been a lot of guidance that you know, the European Commission has put out and as you pointed out, also the European Data Protection Board as well. Um, in terms of what measures companies can take, um, you know, this case by case review is something that they're gonna have to undergo not only for transfers to the United States, of course, but to transfers to any country that doesn't have an adequacy finding uh, already in place. And I think uh, from the US company perspective, one of the things that I have heard and that I am hearing is that there's only, there are things that they can certainly do with supplementary measures and doing an analysis, but if uh, they feel like they are the kind of company that would get um, an order from the US uh, legal system for surveillance, it's hard for um, the supplementary measures alone to, of course, cover that issue. Um, so on that point, let me turn to Estelle, you're, you're, you're nodding your head up and down. Do you, what is your view on the current state of affairs, uh, given the, 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 the transfer issues that are put into play by the Schrems II ruling, and the kinds of measures that you think um, the US and other countries ought to be thinking about to protect privacy in the context of national security. Thank you. Um, maybe to explain from which perspective I'm coming from, I'll just sure. um, explain a little bit what was our position on the privacy shield and that leads to understand how also uh, we're presenting the reform that we think should happen going forward. So. As an international NGO that works to protect and defend people's rights online, we welcome the decision of the court to strike down the privacy shield because it failed to, uh, to comply with the privacy data protection and access to remedy rights protected in Europe. Um, in fact, we had been advocating since the beginning of the existence of the privacy shield for its suspension and we warned that it was not in line with EU standards. And so um, a lot of what we've been discussing today and what you've mentioned is comes into the interaction and implication from the decision, both from the commercial and the intelligence perspective. And what's important to see here is that those two components are linked. We see it in the decision, but we also see it in practice that surveillance is not just hurting people's rights, it's hurting the economy. And um, the way surveillance programs function partly in the US, but also elsewhere, uh, including programs authorized under Section 702, is that they're turning private companies into spying, spying agents, making most of these companies data harvesting practices. So there is a whole set of reform that needs to happen there for better privacy compliance. Um, and reforming surveillance is not to the interest of people being spied on, but also to the company caught in the net of those programs. And what you just mentioned now of the concern of companies that additional measures, if there is no adequacy decision, additional measures to contract existing perhaps will not be sufficient is very true because if they fall under those programs authorized by US surveillance, then there is no additional measures really to counter that there needs to be a reform, which um, is what we put forward. And we know it will take time, but it's, um, it's what we think would be the only sustainable way to ensure um, transfer. Um, maybe to go back super quickly on um, the court decision, it's obviously the court's role is to interpret EU law and determine 
whether EU legal acts are in line with it. And so in this case, it was not a ruling against the US, but against the European Commission in itself, uh, the European Commission decision. And it was a clarification on how the rights we have in Europe should apply in context of data transfer. But it's not the first time that a court does this. And it's also not the first time that um, it's not the only country because the US was involved. It has also taken decision against surveillance measure in France in the UK and in other countries. So the court is um, raising its experience and expertise, but also it's developing its jurisprudence on surveillance and is really, it's our higher court. So this ruling is really important, which is why we need to take the requirements that the court has put um, very seriously. And also because it's not the first time we found ourselves in this situation, you mentioned it before with the first invalidation of the safe harbor, we can also learn from that experience. And Back then, from our perspective, the needed reforms were not conducted in order to ensure that um, the privacy shield or any other transfer mechanism that would have been agreed would be sustainable. And so what should happen now to avoid this? It's reforms, it's surveillance reforms, and it's legislative reforms also that needs to happen to grant um, um, non-US person, including EU citizen, a proper right to remedy. Um, I'd also like to make a point that there is also an opportunity for the US to adopt a strong federal privacy law, which is not within necessarily the requirement of the court, but because we're discussing an adequacy decision, usually the EU enters into those discussions with countries who have um, comprehensive data protection law. And so there are sectoral laws in the US and there are some states who have um, privacy law, but having a federal privacy law would really greatly help those discussion, even though it's not addressing some of the shortcomings on access to uh, data by government agencies. And so specifically on the surveillance reform and on the redress, the reforms that we are asking in order to comply with the court requirement, it's to end bulk general um, data collection, which is mostly authorized under executive order 12333 and to narrow the categories of person who may be targeted under surveillance, which is both under the same executive order and section 702. And then there is a need to create a proper mechanism for redress. So the privacy shield created somewhat of an interim system, which was not found to be independent enough in um, a good vehicle for redress. And so these measures for us would need to be done through proper legislative changes in Congress rather than only through uh, executive order or um, executive action. There could be a pass where it could start there and, and move to Congress. And we do know it takes time. We do know it's not an easy process, but we also do know that we don't want to find ourselves in the same situation as now or as, as four years ago in another two years discussing the implication of shrimp three. And so <laughs> these reforms are complicated, but I do see even from this discussion that there is willingness from both sides, the EU and the US, to find this solution and to find it sustainably so we don't have to go over the same the same debate. And yes, reforming surveillance has been a long time coming and it needs to be coming in Europe as well. But because there is this opportunity here, uh, we should take it. So that's on the specific reform, happy to discuss also then more. We have put forward some specific uh, recommendation. And I also want to give um, a mention here to uh, our colleagues from ACLU in the US, the American Civil Liberties Un Union, who has put a lot of work also in detailing how those reform could go uh, to also benefit US citizens. Because obviously, when we talk about surveillance, it's not just to the reform, it's not just to the interests of uh, European and others, but also of um, American citizens. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there's a lot, a lot there to to, to talk about, Estelle. Um, but we seem to have Dylan back. Uh, so let me let me before before we go back on, before we continue, uh, let me ask the uh, people participating in this virtually. If you have a question, please use the Q and A function, um, and I'll be scanning it and trying to work it into the discussion. Um, so Dylan, if you're back with us, we did skip, we had to skip you. And so we've had, a, and I, I don't know, you've been in and out a little bit trying to get your connection straight. Um, so uh, for now, it'd be, I think, helpful at this stage to clarify a little further what the Schrems 2 case actually said um, about uh, the, the, the state of our legal framework as compared to the standard that the court was laying out in that case. and. Um, um, just so, so comment, just, just what did the court hold in terms of our national security uh, framework in the US? Um, okay, uh, thank you. And uh, my apologies, I've rejiggered our internet at home here 
and uh, I hope we're back on. If we fail again, just uh, leave me out. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll assume you've covered most of the background of the case to, to try to answer Alex's question and also to mention a couple other interesting things about the question that may provoke some discussion. Um, let me first say, um, the, um, what the court did is, uh, in addition to finding standard contract clauses valid as a transfer mechanism with the obligations um, on companies to verify that the destination country has protections in its law that are um, uh, meeting EU standards for privacy, um, the court then went on to say, well, in cases where the European Commission has issued an adequacy decision, um, uh, companies no, don't need to do that um, because the EU has spoken regarding the destination countries' laws. And for that reason, uh, the European Court of Justice found that it needed to address the validity of the privacy shield decision, the, uh, the adequacy decision issued by the commission in 2016. Um, so when the court did uh, examine U.S. law related to national security surveillance and uh, data access by intelligence agencies of the United States, it didn't really address the large body of evidence that had been generated by the five-week trial in uh, Ireland that had led to the case. So, that, so just to remind folks, if you didn't cover it, um, the case was referred to the European Court of Justice to address certain issues of, of EU law after the Irish court that referred it had, had undertaken a five-week trial, um, largely about US law related to uh, intelligence data access and uh, privacy safeguards that are relevant to that access. And uh, after all that trial and all that argument and with expert witnesses, it referred 11 questions to the court relating to how to handle this under the transfer mechanisms available under the GDPR. And, uh, but, but when the court did get to that point in its July 16th decision, it didn't even mention the five weeks of, uh, of trial in, in Dublin or, or mention any of the evidence. Rather, the court said, because um, the primary decision that the court ruled on, which was that contract clauses can be a valid way um, for making transfers, but they aren't even, aren't even needed when there's an adequacy decision in place. Uh, it said be, because, because of that, I, the court found it needed to address whether the privacy shield adequacy decision was valid because companies wanting to send data to the United States needed to know whether there was a valid, valid adequacy decision in place or not. So the court proceeded to examine US law only by looking at the um, evidence the commission had recorded uh, on, in the adequacy decision itself. Um, so with, uh, we don't have time to get into all the intricacies of US um, surveillance law, um, but it spent, the court spent a, a um, basically uh, found um, the US uh, authorities and statutes and means of requiring uh, companies to disclose data um, to the to intelligence agencies as not proportional under the uh, EU con legal concept of proportionality and not having adequate redress rights for individuals who are subject to surveillance. But again, only looking at the um, evidence in the commission's record created for the privacy shield adequacy decision in 2016. In other words, when companies today, now that that adequacy decision has been invalidated by the court, when companies today in the EU are uh, considering sending data to the United States, uh, uh, the, 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 the scenario they're looking at is there's no adequacy decision in place. So they are subject to the part of the court's ruling that says standard contract clauses are an available mechanism. Uh, they have to certainly consider what the court said um, about US surveillance law, um, but they uh, can examine US law, surveillance law as it exists today, not in 2016, there have been some reforms. And also they can consider information that the commission did not include in, um, 
its 2016 adequacy decision. So, so, so uh, that's one um, perspective on the decision. Uh, let me also address the U.S. government's position in the litigation briefly, and then I'll I'll, um, I'll uh, turn to the next speaker or, or questions. Um, our, our basic position in the in the litigation, and we we were appearing as an amicus party in the Dublin proceedings in proceedings in Ireland, um, and a, a similar role in the before the ECJ was that um, U.S. Intelligence surveillance law and national security data access law um, has robust safeguards, um, and in fact, they are quite similar to the ones that have been that, that have been put in place in uh, in European countries. And there's quite a similar story in both countries. I think basically since the advent in the middle of last century, uh, in, the, in the middle of the 20th century of uh, of telecommunications and uh, digital and electronic communications among uh, people, um, there's been an opportunity to conduct signals intelligence surveillance. And there's a, a need to respect privacy uh, in that context. And in, in Europe, as well as in the United States, we've had our share of abuses and reforms. And in, in, uh, on both continents, um, uh, there's a, a, a history of 50 years of uh, judicial decisions, of statutes written, and um, uh, the basic safeguards that I think both countries, or both uh, countries on both continents respect, are the ones uh, roughly set out by the European Court of Human Rights that uh, uh, you know, surveillance uh, must be based on uh, clear statutes that are accessible to to the uh, the society. Um, 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 uh, data access. Um, must be reasonable or proportional in nature. Um, how the how the government handles data uh, after it's received must be uh, proportional to its needs. Uh, there must be redress rights if if intelligence laws are violated, and uh, there, especially because redress is not always available uh, practically because many often intelligence targets don't know they're being surveilled. Uh, it's very important to have independent oversight mechanisms within uh, a government intelligence um, surveillance system. Um, so our the, the, our submissions to the court were simply that we have a robust system and uh, we think we stand up well. And in fact, if you look at European countries, uh, similar systems, uh, we stand up well and have equivalent or um, or uh, greater safeguards. And there is much much information uh, available about European countries' systems, uh, given the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and other uh, EU documents. So, um, so let me stop there and turn it back. Yeah, to that's, you. that's great, Dylan. That was very helpful. Um, I, I, I think you did say a couple of thought-provoking things there. One of them, um, well, I, I guess I take all of that and think there's some uncertainty still here in terms of what the court ruled, what it, what it actually meant. So one of the one of the issues that you've raised is that it based its decision on the factual descriptions in the adequacy finding from the European Commission and didn't at least in the opinion show evidence of a of its views on all of the other submissions that the United States made about its system. So I think there's a little bit, at least in my mind, of uncertainty as to how the court would rule uh, next time a case comes before it. What set of facts would it use? Um, Alex Greenstone, what do you what do you what do you make of the way forward here? So we have a ruling. It struck down Privacy Shield. It preserved standard contractual clauses. It raised issues about basically two aspects of national security law in the United States. One is whether it's proportional, as Dylan said, the collection authorities, are they sufficiently limited? And the other one is, is there adequate redress for people to get their rights um, uh, addressed in a, in, by, by an independent tribunal? What, do you, what, what is the government doing with this situation going forward? Well, I mean, I can sort of go into the details of sort of what we're discussing with sort of uh, Rosalba and our like counterparts in the commission, but I can say that sort of we are focused on sort of very substantive things that we can do to address those concerns that the court raised. I mean, certainly this is, um, we aren't in a position to sort of, we can't relitigate the case and certainly like, you know, but we can sort of um, 
take some concrete actions to provide greater redress and address the court's concerns there. And then also like, you know, some other things we can do to sort of address the um, issues raised by the court. And so that's something that we're discussing right now with our um, counterparts in the commission. And then sort of one other point that I would make is just that the reason that we're also so much so focused on um, these enhancements to privacy shield is also that um, these commitments from the United States would also apply to other transfer mechanisms. And that's the goal that we had. That's what we did with uh, the initial privacy shield. And it's our um, plan that sort of the enhancements that we would make to privacy shield um, in this circumstance would also extend to cover uh, the SECs and other transfer mechanisms, bringing greater certainty back to those transfers. So as, as Rosalba was saying, then as companies look to see whether or not their supplementary measures are gonna be sufficient and they have to assess the law in the recipient country they can take whatever measures you've been discussing into effect. Rosalba, do you have a uh, something to add from the EU perspective, from the EC? Sorry, uh, Alex, but I can't resist to 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 rebut uh, the the opinion of uh, my colleague Dylan. Um, so I mean, I understand very well. I mean, the need uh, from the US side to try to explain better. I mean, how the national security uh, system function in uh, in the US to the public. But saying that the European Court of Justice has not taken into consideration enough material to take what is a constitutional judgment from us. I mean, this is our constitutional court. It's like the Supreme Court in the United States. It has been an intense litigation with more than 10 of member states participating. The commission um, has really defended the decision with all its force. The United States had had the opportunity to submit, to submit all the arguments they wanted. So saying that the, the court was not well informed to take the appropriate decision. I don't think this is uh, the right approach to take now and does not lead anywhere. Now we have just to take into account that we have a constitutional judgment with very clear indication on where to go if we want to announce our framework and to uh, ensure a free flow of data between Europe and United States. One thing. And the second is on the, our member states. Our member states are under double scrutiny. Our member state and the national security system of our members, not only as the Privacy International and the La Quadrature du Net recent case law has shown, uh, is under the scrutiny of the European Court of Justice, but they're also bound by the European Court, uh, the European Court of Strasbourg, that has uh, abundant jurisprudence and has uh, led many, 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 many times to. Uh, reform the um, surveillance um, system in uh, our member states. So I would say that this recurrent argument to say that we have double standard and uh, we um, here in Europe, uh, we uh, use different standards for our member states and, uh, and, uh, and the US or any other third country is quite old and not substantiated. Well, I do think there's a disagreement on that, uh, Rosalba. I do, I, I, um, I, I do, we haven't explained it. I think this is the American Society for International Law. So I'm sure that most of the people watching understand the European Convention of Human Rights and, and where that came from, the whole history, the post-World War II era uh, around that. And then the more recent jurisprudence as Estella was uh, alluding to, uh, where the Court of Justice of the European Union is now um, issuing rulings, as you pointed out, Rosalba, in the last two cases, um, which are now applying, extending, uh, I think in the, in the view of many observers, extending its reach into national security areas that were traditionally the province of the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to the Court of Justice in the European Union. So at a minimum, it does create an interesting tension in, for EU member states where they now, as you point out, are subject to this double scrutiny, whereas before they could focus primarily or even exclusively on the European Convention on Human Rights and that jurisprudence from the court, which is what Dylan was referring to. Dylan, you wanna, you wanna respond? Um, yeah, sure, just briefly on two, those two points. I know we're running out of time. Uh, um, again, again just, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not uh, suggesting, uh, as Rosalba said, that the 
the large uh, record in the litigation, which was before the court of justice was ignored by the court or was not reviewed or, or uh, digested. They may have understood it deeply or may have not. But what the decision reflects is that the court did not review the state of US law per se. It did not review any, it did not support any of its findings by that body of evidence. Rather, it uh, explicitly undertook the exercise of examining only the validity of the adequacy shield, or the privacy shield adequacy decision of the commission. Its uh, analysis depended on that evidence and its ruling in the final operative paragraph at the last page of the judgment is not that the United States legal system is itself inadequate, rather it's only that the privacy shield adequacy decision is inadequate. So I believe uh, there's uh, there's room for, um, for example, a, there, there's been five years and uh, the legal system is different now. Uh, there are things that weren't in the commission's uh, judgment or uh, decision that were um, that that the court focused on that uh, companies might look to. But but again, this is a, an issue of EU law that, that really companies have to consider. So I, I'm not uh, telling companies how to do their analysis, but I, under a, a, a from a U.S. lawyer's view, it would appear that um, that there's room to uh, to consider the decision. And it was just and just to make clear for the audience regarding the second issue of uh, so-called double standards, or um, I think we actually have very similar standards in the in Europe and the United States, as I say, on national security data, data access and privacy safeguards. Um, but but this is a new area for the European Union Court of Justice. The European Union treaties exclude national security issues uh, from the European Union's competence. Um, the court and the commission, and Rosalba can correct me, uh, are, are now sort of um, taking steps to uh, uh, um, uh, ex expand their um, work into that area. And um, be because sometimes there's an overlap <laughs> when private companies are, are dealing with data um, that is subject to data protection laws of the EU and how uh, EU member states might require those companies to disclose the data to the government, um, that's, that might be within the national security area. So, so the court, the European Court of Justice, for the first time, to my knowledge, uh, three months ago, uh, issued a decision related to member states, the national security data access. So there's hardly a jurisprudential body here. There's simply uh, one uh, decision or a set of decisions on October 6th that are, are the first time the Court of Justice has started to uh, lay down standards in that area. Okay, thanks Dylan. I know uh, Rosalba, you have to go in just a couple of minutes, is that right? Um, uh, I did wanna give you a chance to uh, say any, any, uh, any last words. I also wanted to throw out the issue of we have a new administration coming in we have a new Congress coming in, and I was interested in the views of the participants as to whether that will change uh, any particular aspect of the dynamic, or do we expect um, sort of continuity here or, or, or dramatic change? What, what is the view? So let me start. Yeah. Well, um, just, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to keep it long to rebut to what Dylan said, but I mean, uh, the court was very clear uh, when it assessed the, the FISA and uh, the, um, the absence of limitation and safeguard in the FISA itself. So I don't think it's, uh, it assessed only the adequacy decision, but it really looked into the US law. Just to conclude on, the, on maybe this different interpretation of uh, the judgment. And for your last question, um, I would say that uh, the negotiation of uh, the privacy shield and the safe harbor before uh, has never been party line. I mean, we are ready and to, to negotiate with any administrations. Um, we just want to find a solid solution, not quick fix. We don't want to be annulled for the third time. There is um, a positive uh, consensus around the, the increasing um, protection of privacy in the world. Um, in the US, in United States also, we have seen several uh, states adopting uh, privacy in le legislation. So I think this is a very positive trend for uh, our work and we want to continue on, uh, on this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rosalba. Anybody else wanna jump in?
Go ahead, Estelle. Thank you. Um, I want to echo what Rosalba has said on the court decision, the court analysis. Also, you know, it's the court rules to interpret EU law. So obviously it will be looking a lot into what the commission has done in determining adequacy, but obviously it has considered what the US has done. And it's also the latest case uh, on looking into access on, on the data retention case from the UK, France and Belgium were important, but we're, they were not the first time that the EU court did this. Um, we have a Digital Rights Ireland case from 2014, prior Safe Harbor 1 or Trans Run. Uh, we have another ruling on data retention and access by um, national uh, nas member state national authorities to data from also 2016. So yes, maybe we don't have loads and loads of cases, but the court has been invalidated the EU Act and has been also forcing when the data retention law in Europe was invalidated by the court. All of the telecom operators in Europe suddenly found themselves looking at their member state and asking, what should we do? Do we keep the data? Do we not? Because it did not invalidate the national law, but the EU law above it. So just to say that these questions, we are also asking ourselves here. And for many, many years, there's been also the Strasbourg court, obviously, with these jurisdictions pushing for reform. So um, in the sense that, yes, we may have similar surveillance law in Europe and in the US, but they're equally being judged as non-compliant with human rights by the European courts. Um, so there is a problem altogether that needs to be fixed. And we can spend a lot of time, and that actually happened during Safe Harbor last time. We can spend a lot of time on pointing out what maybe the court didn't see, didn't ask, or what was not submitted or consulted. But the point here is that we need to move forward on solution to better protect privacy because no matter how deep you want to look, there is an issue on how privacy is being protected altogether and the past adequacy systems were not sufficient to do that and now we need to really spend a good amount of time doing this and and this links to the second question you had i also agree that i think even though the the shield was negotiated under the obama administration and now a new administration is coming here this issue does not really fall under partisan um, line in the US. And so uh, there is maybe not going to be a huge amount of changes into the, uh, the type of negotiation or discussion going on. But the privacy discussion in the US has evolved greatly over the past years. And so there may be an opportunity because of that, not necessarily because of a change of administration, but because of how much this issue is also part of the political debate um, in, in Washington. Yes, thank you, Estella. I do agree that privacy attitudes have been changing, have been evolving, and uh, certainly the EU has been a leader in terms of identifying um, a, 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 a comprehensive approach to privacy protection. Alex, do you have any uh, last words here? Sure, I guess sort of like, you know, one final point I'd like to make is just sort of that, I mean, different interpretations of sort of the ruling aside, I mean, the US and the EU are fundamentally like-minded on this topic and we're committed to finding a solution because we recognize that it's important for our citizens to be able to transfer data um, across the Atlantic and for us to be able to do business with one another. And also, I mean, fundamentally, I mean, we both care about privacy. We both recognize that sort of like there needs to be an appropriate um, balancing of sort of uh, privacy, but also sort of public security interests. And it's something that we as democracies can work together to like, you know, figure out. And so, I mean, I think that that's something that is, it can be a little bit like, you know, easy to sort of lose sight of that. But I mean, ultimately we're sort of on the same page more or less. And it's a matter of sort of just discussing this and working through to find a solution that um, both enable sort of data transfers, uh, but also protects the security of sort of like you know, our citizens and sort of Europeans, because ultimately sort of um, we are partners in this. And so it's something that we do need to sort of work out together. And I mean, we're doing that. I mean, that's we're having ongoing discussions with Rosalba and her colleagues. And um, we've done this before and we can do it again. So we'll um, continue working on this. Yes, uh, so thank you. I think that's a good optimistic note to end on. We do, we, we have entered a new era, uh, not necessarily in terms of the administration, but, but the digital um, uh, revolution is well, well, well upon us. And I think attitudes are changing all over the world in terms of what we do with all of this data that's flowing around. We have to come up with a solution. It's not mission impossible, it's mission essential. 
Um, and I think uh, for my optic, it has to be a solution that works um, not only in the United States, not only in the European Union, not only among EU, EU member states, but, but among like-minded democracies. And we have to figure out a way of, of doing that. I wanna thank the panel. It was an interesting uh, uh, discussion as always. Um, I think we have, I still feel we have more in common than we have a, a, a difference. So thank you so much for everybody's time.